Hello everyone. Um, the session's about to start. I'd like to introduce Dennis Kinziel. He's going to talk about open phono. Dennis. Okay. Hey guys. So I'm here to talk about uh, an open source project that is trying to create a telephony stack, completely open source. And uh, it's called Ophono. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself, I'm Dennis Kinzier. I work for Intel Open Source Technology Center. I'm actually based out of Austin, Texas, but most of the OTC guys are in Portland, Oregon. So, um, what are we going to talk about? So, basically, I want to introduce why we started Ophono, what it is all about. Um, review some of the recent history and basically say where we are today. Um, briefly talk about the future work uh, and hopefully have some time for a demo and then questions as well. Um, so reasons for starting. Uh, basically when I joined OTC we were essentially OTC responsible for Moblin which is a distribution for mobile devices and we actually have about three market segments that we're trying to go after with mobile. Uh, obviously netbooks, so you've probably heard of mobile for netbooks. But we also have uh, the mid segment, which is the mobile internet devices. And we're also targeting IVI, which is the infotainment for vehicles. And uh, pretty much all of these uh, segments actually have telephony requirements. And some of them are actually quite different. Uh, but we found that if we actually have a comprehensive telephony solution, that we can address all of them. Uh, we also found that uh, there are plenty of different types of modems out there that we need to support. So probably all of you are familiar with uh, AT commands. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not um, what every modem out there uses today. There are actually some that have vendor proprietary protocols or even um, completely binary protocols. Um, and then there are also uh, devices which are sort of kind of telephony devices, but they're not a full-blown solution. So if you've ever sort of read the Bluetooth hands-free profile specification, you'll know that it is essentially a modem. So we basically said, you know, we need to actually support all of these devices um, if we are to succeed. Um, when we started, we did actually uh, look at some of the existing projects. So in my prior life, I actually worked for Trolltech uh, out of Brisbane. And uh, there we developed Utopia. So that's another uh, open source telephony solution. Um, unfortunately, that project is no longer being developed. And there were actually a lot of problems with it. Um, it used a custom interprocess communication system, not DBUS. Uh, it actually was based on Qt, which is a bit too big to be a system daemon. And there were other issues as well. Uh, we also did look at FSO, but uh, that project is really not mature enough. And I think they went slightly on a different track uh, than they should have. Um, their APIs are a bit too low level. Uh, and they really didn't consider some of the uh, use cases that we have to actually support. So we sort of said, okay, we actually need to uh, start a new project for this. Um, and so before we actually started, we actually thought long and hard of why these projects fail um, and why there was no open source solution uh, for telephony uh, up until this time. And really what we sort of learned from past experience and uh, making those mistakes is that uh, GSM is hard. It is actually a pretty big specification. Uh, it is voluminous. I mean, there are literally thousands of pages they actually have to read. And uh, the language of those pages is the most dry stuff you've ever read. Uh, unfortunately, you basically have to read them all in order to gain a comprehensive idea of what, what is actually going on. So that's, that's actually the really hard part. And one of the failings of both projects, uh, Kitopia and OpenMoco, is that they really didn't do that. Um, the other 
huge problem is that it's really not that exciting. It's you know pretty boring stuff. So GSM is you know 20 year old technology for the most part. So nobody really is that interested in actually uh, doing it. Um, so basically, we said that um, we're not going to do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to try something new, and uh, basically, we're going to try to put everything into the daemon so that once we are actually finished with the project, some definition of finished, uh, nobody else would actually have to go through the pain that we have to go through. Uh, a lot of other mistakes that the current solutions make is that they actually e expose too much details up to the application writer. And that is something that you basically expect the application writer to know a lot of the GSM details. That is wrong. And we, from the very uh, beginning, actually uh, recognized that as a major problem. In Keytopia, we had this all the time, where the telephony expert really knew the answer to a lot of things, but he wasn't writing the UI. And so the UI writers would actually write the UI and get it wrong. And uh, that led to uh, a lot of unnecessary work and a lot of rework, actually. And we also try not to support features, or not to expose features which are not supported by the modem or by the network, for instance. Um, but we do want to actually do as much in the core daemon. So basically, the core daemon should do as much for you as possible. And uh, we will also try to make the core daemon work without a user interface. So basically, even if you have you know, an embedded system you're trying to bring it up, you can still uh, start uh, the system daemon, and it will do most of the things that it needs to do with any, without any intervention, really. All right, so I touched briefly on this, but yeah, basically, GSM is pretty freaking hard. Um, there's lots and lots of uh, supplementary services. There's lots of sort of rules for how you do things. And most of those rules are sort of technology-based. Uh, the radio technology evolved, and it was really primitive when it started. And so a lot of things that are special rules or special things that you need to do, um, which are not really sensical. They're not really common sense. And so this applies to things like call handling and SMS um, and the various other things. Also, it's a very bloated protocol. So over time, there's been lots of uh, enhancements, so vendor enhancements, and also network operator enhancements. So just to give an example, uh, enhanced SMS, which is uh, Ericsson standard, that basically bolts on an extra couple of hundred pages of a specification on top of SMS, which is already something like 200 pages long. So it, yeah, there's lots of stuff to actually do. Uh, Nokia has their comp competition standard, which is called smart messaging. So that one's also pretty large. And then there's things like uh, WAP, which used to be the killer app. Now nobody really uses it anymore. Um, and there's also limitations in terms of hardware and the storage. Um, it used to be that basically everything was stored on the SIM, so your SMSs were stored on the SIM, your contacts were stored on the SIM. Unfortunately, the problem is, is that the SIM storage is pretty limited, and so um, you really don't want to deal with those uh, technical limitations when you have a 40 gigabyte solid state drive. Um, and there's also the problem that GSM is actually in its fourth evolution now. So pretty much the fourth is still being defined, but everyone's familiar with the 3G. So that's basically third uh, generation. So it's basically the third evolution of the specification. And pretty much every evolution of the specification actually brought new features, but never uh, deprecated old ones. So you basically have to support everything uh, that has been in the spec for the last 20 years. Uh, not fun. Uh, also, when they were designing the, uh, the technology, essentially, uh, they had very limited bandwidth at the time. I mean, probably most of you remember the 
the time of 1200 baud modems. That's basically what these guys were working with. And so when they were defining the protocol, they basically made every bit count. Um, that sort of manifests itself in the seven bit alphabet that they use for SMS. So uh, if you were to use regular eight bit alphabet, uh, SMS PDU is about 140 bytes. So they said, okay, we actually want to extend that. So they created their own alphabet, not ASCII, but something else. Uh, and now you can actually send 160 bytes. Uh, sorry, 160 characters in those 140 bytes. Uh, and pretty much everything is a binary structure. So uh, in the land of you know XML structure, XML files and formats and um, you know what we have today, uh, binary data structures are rather uncommon. And there's a reason for that. Uh, but those guys really didn't have the luxury of having this, so much bandwidth that we do today. Uh, and finally, we have broken hardware. A lot of hardware today is broken. Uh, even today, we are dealing with uh, bugs in firmware, bugs in uh, various hardware devices that we have to support. So it's a big issue. So, I mean, all, given all of these problems, we decided to do basically to throw away features that are no longer pertinent uh, for our day and age. <laughs> um, so one of the things we do is we don't use uh, the SIM for anything. We don't use SIM for contacts. We don't use SIM for storing SMS. So that gets rid of a lot of uh, sort of code and issues that you would have in a typical solution and we basically don't deal with this because there's really no sense to do this. So basically, we said, OK, we actually will start a new project. Um, and from the very beginning, we, because we're Moblin and we're targeting all these different platforms, we said, we will actually support all kinds of devices and not necessarily smartphones. So this is not a smartphone only stack like FSL. Uh, basically, we want to target all systems, so we don't really care what is running on top. So you can have K GNOME KDE, uh, you can have the Nokia UI, you can have the Moblin UI, you can do anything you want. Uh, we're also independent from the PIM framework, so again, you can use whatever you want. And uh, distribution independent, so a phone actually has packages for Ubuntu, for Debian, uh, for Gentoo, I think, now, and Moblin. So, again, completely independent. Uh, we want to design this as a system daemon with minimal dependencies. So, right now, the dependencies are glib, and that's it. Uh, oh, sorry, and dbus. glib and dbus, and that's it. Um, and fully modular. So, components have to be pretty independent, and I'll sort of explain a little bit later how this is accomplished. And everything has to be extendable and customizable. Um, another big sort of goal that we have was to make the UI easily replaceable and rewritable. Uh, the reason for this is that there's a lot of branding inside the UI, but you don't necessarily want uh, to have a lot of logic in the UI. You can easily replace the branding, but it's very, very hard to uncouple the logic from the actual presentation layer. And uh, so this is the reason why we basically want to stuff all the logic into the daemon and then make the UI essentially a very small shell. Uh, so the big part for this basically comes down to the API design. Uh, the application writer has to be, you know, it has to be very easy to use uh, our system so that the application designer focuses on what he does best and that is all the flashy animations and all that sort of stuff and not sort of the boring system protocols that we're dealing with. Uh, and we also want to consider all the certification and product um, what's the right word? Uh, product testing by you know the relevant uh, agencies like FCC and the carriers. So we want to consider that from the very beginning. So this is what we did. We started a phono, which is essentially a core system daemon. It has a DBus API. 
It was actually launched jointly between Intel and Nokia in May of 2009. It is GPL version 2, so pretty much everything that we do inside the daemon has to be completely open source. And there was a lot of whinging about that in the very beginning from various vendors, but um, I think they're coming around now. Um, plugins can be GPL or actually any sort of license that is compatible with GPL, so certain versions of DSD can also be actually used. Um, and the client applications can be of any license. So the UI can actually be completely closed. But everything in the core daemon has to be completely open. Uh, so this is sort of the architecture. Um, so the UI layer is on top. Uh, we basically have the Ophono Debus API that is sort of the, the main interaction point between the uh, applications and the system. And then we have the core layer, uh, some of the utility functions that we use for things like SMS decoding and stuff like that. Um, and uh, then comes the sort of modem adaptation or hardware adaptation layer, which is what we call the modem plugin API. And there you can actually have several different kinds of modems that you support. So Nokia modems or you know, IT command modems or something else. So lo loosely, this is what this is the components that we have inside of Phono. We have plugins. We have a concept of a modem. So this is sort of the object that you interact with. Uh, we have a concept of a modem driver, and we have a concept of an atom. So atom is something that is essentially an object that or an interface for Java geeks. And it loosely translates to a Dbus interface. And so an Atom can basically handle things like network registration or voice calls or you know, SMS sending and receiving. So essentially, it's some grouped functionality that we said it's similar enough. Uh, and we basically group it into an Atom. And we have Atom drivers for specific hardware. So this is sort of how it looks like. So basically, inside of Ono, you would have multiple modem objects. We actually support unlimited modems. We're not limited in any way. So if you have a netbook with you know, 20 GPRS cards, we can actually handle that. Um, inside a modem, you will have a modem driver, which actually uh, tells the system, or actually handles initialization of the hardware, bringing it up and down. Uh, you have a bunch of atoms that are supported by this hardware. And for each atom, you have an atom driver which basically sort of handles the low-level details of interacting with the hardware. Um, plugins, pretty much everything in Ophono is a plugin. So all the, especially all the drivers, uh, all the Atom drivers, all the modem drivers, they're all plugins. So you can actually um, enable, disable one uh, or all of them. And uh, if you're running on an embedded system and you know exactly what uh, driver you're using, you can actually say, I only want this one, and everything else is disabled. So you can actually be as flexible as you want. Uh, we also do uh, detection of modem hardware in using a plugin. So that's another uh, thing that we use them for. Uh, and there's basically three kinds of devices that we use right now. One is a sort of static configuration. Uh, this is handled by the modem conf driver. So if you have an old serial modem, you can use this. Um, UDEV, so pretty much most other devices like USB um, will actually support UDEV, so that is the most common uh, plugin that we use for device detection today. And uh, there's also Phonet ISI, which is used by the Nokia modems to do their device detection. All right. Um, some of the other things that the plugins can do, uh, they can actually read and write to the SIM. They can send uh, and process SMS messages and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, basically, the reason for this is that we want to keep the core very, very small. And then if you have things like carrier requirements coming in and saying, hey, we want to support carrier logos. Well, fine. Just create a new Ophono plugin that will actually you know, process the specific SMS message with the carrier logo. And then uh, you can actually have the plugin define a new API 
and expose that. So it sort of keeps the core system really, really small and simple, and then allows infinite custom, uh, customizability for uh, the eventual integrator or the vendor. Uh, we also have, um, when, when I showed you that we support pretty much any PIM database, well, the, the reason we do this is, or the reason we can do this is by using the plugins for uh, SMS and call history. So you essentially create a plugin for, you know, your favorite database of choice, either EDS or address book or whatever else you have, and you can actually do it this way. All right, uh, modem and modem drivers. Let's see. Uh, basically, the modem represents an actual device in the system. So if you have a data card, like I do here, this will be exposed as a modem object inside of Phono. Uh, we can basically obtain various information about the device, like manufacturer and revision, and the model and the IMEI number. We can power the device on and off. And uh, we basically... The, the other part of what the modem driver does is it actually tells the core what features the modem supports. So some modems actually support a fairly large amount of features. Some modems don't. And uh, this actually lets us very flexibly tell the user what this modem actually has and does not have. Um, and we're planning to do some power management in the future here as well. All right, Adams. Um, they implement specific functionality. So there is a voice call atom, there is a uh, SMS atom, there is a network registration atom. Basically, some part, some logical, you know, separation uh, of functionality. And inside the system, the atoms actually interact with each other. So we actually do atom detection from other atoms. So just to give you an example. Um, uh, for cell broadcasts, there are certain cell broadcasts that are actually specific for network registration. They basically report where you are, so like the suburb. Uh, and so the cell broadcast, when it comes in, it goes to the cell broadcast atom. But actually, the information should be presented via the network registration atom because it's completely useless otherwise. And so the cell broadcast atom will actually detect network registration atom and say, well, here's this information. So there, we do a lot of sort of um, so, what used to be part of the UI application, with you know all the logic associated with grabbing the information out of the uh, telephony stack and putting it into the UI, we actually do it completely inside the daemon, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, so, what else do atoms do? Uh, they ex typically they expose some sort of an interface, a DBus interface, for external applications. So I'll actually show you an example of an uh, interface document that we have for all of these. And uh, pretty much all Atom, with exception of a few, uh, all Atoms actually have an interface on top of the main modem object. So again, I, I can show you how that looks like a little bit. Um, and they can also create other paths and objects inside the system that represent um, something that they manage. So. For instance, network registration will actually have several network operators uh, that it manages. Uh, GPRS will have contexts for various uh, contexts for things like MMS or you know 3D data or voicemail or something else. And uh, the voice calls atom will actually have voice call that represents the currently active call in the system. Um, atom drivers, they basically um, essentially do the low-level operations. So they know how the hardware works, they know what the hardware does, and basically they get, you know, they implement a set of uh, operations that have been agreed upon and uh, implement them for some particular hardware. So just to give you an example, uh, the dial um, function inside the voice call atom driver will actually send an ATD, for instance. All right, so what can we do today? Um, so we pretty much are complete solution for telephony. We actually handle most of the use cases, uh, most of the things that you actually need to do. Uh, so we can register, deregister, select operators. We can uh, make and receive calls, and we support pretty much 
all the uh, voice call uh, use cases. So we can do simple one-way calls, uh, we can do three-way calls, and we can even do multi-party calls. So all of those things like hold and retrieve and all that sort of stuff we actually handle. Uh, we can also do DTMF. Uh, SMS, we handle pretty much everything associated with SMS with the exception of the extended protocols. So things like smart messaging or enhanced messaging, we actually don't do. But uh, uh, internationalization, you know, two-bit, uh, sorry, two-byte um, character sets, we support all of that sort of stuff. And we even do um, fragmentation and defragmentation. So if you have, you know, five SMS fragments, we actually defragment all of that and just give you the final message. So you basically, all you need to do is just present the message to the user. You don't actually have to do any of the hard stuff. Uh, cell broadcast, we support that. GPRS, this is still work in progress. We actually support certain hardware modems for this. Uh, we don't support the majority of them yet, but we're working on it. And we pretty much support all the supplementary services defined by 3GPP. So, Things like call waiting, call forwarding, advice of charge, we do all that. Um, so if you were to say, you know, can we make a 2G iPhone with this? Yeah, you can. We're actually that far along. Um, some of the devices we support, so the FreeRunner, this is out of the OpenMoco project. Um, this modem is more or less supported except for GPRS. Uh, we're still working on that because that requires uh, PPP. Uh, various data cards from Ericsson, so pretty much all the MBM data cards are supported. Um, all the option modems, though, that we have come across. So if you have an option modem, you can actually try it with a phone today. Uh, any sort of generic device or device that supports generic um, AT commands defined by 3GPP should be supported. Uh, there might need to be some integration, but um, there probably always will need to be some integration. Um, and Nokia is actually contributing support for their modems. So there is some limited support for the Nokia N900. Uh, and in the future, uh, it seems that Nokia will actually use Ophono in their systems. Uh, we also support Bluetooth hands-free client. So essentially, you can use Ophono to create a car kit. Uh, or you know even use uh, a phone as a sort of use, use your la laptop as a headset to your mobile phone. So we support that um, use case as well. And uh, there's phone sim, which is a tool that we use for uh, doing some basic testing. I can show you phone sim a little later if we have time. Um, okay. A lot of emphasis actually went into API design. So our APIs, well, sort of the, the four principles that we try to follow is to be consistent, uh, to be minimal, complete, and easy to use. So any any time a new API is proposed, we actually use these four principles to gauge it and see whether it fits. Um, really, the important part is the, is the minimal part, where we basically try not to confuse the user and make it uh, essentially only one way of doing something. So. The, the less there is of an API documentation to read, the faster you can get started, the faster you can actually get something done. And the more we do in the core daemon, the less you have to do yourself. So that's sort of the, the, the probably the primary one. Um, and easy to use as well. So again, that sort of goes hand in hand. Um, make UI writers job easier, so we already talked a lot about that, but uh, some one of the key takeaways here is that because there is a central daemon, you can actually separate your UI tasks uh, into sort of logically um, different applications. So if you, you can have a dialer that doesn't keep any external state or internal state. Uh, you can have an SMS client that is completely independent, doesn't have to talk to the dialer at all. Uh, basically, all of the state is being maintained by the daemon. So uh, any UI application you write, you can start up, uh, synchronize your state with the uh, with Ophono, and then basically just listen for the signals that are relevant to you. 
So it makes things a lot easier if you've ever developed uh, telephony applications before. Um, again, the UI applications do not need to be resident, so you're actually saving some memory. Again, because the daemon is actually keeping all the state. And uh, also, the important part is that state query is very, very fast. Um, so once we query the network for something, we actually don't have to do it again. And so if you ever use your iPhone and you go into settings and you know it goes in and queries the state, you exit out, you go into settings again, it has to re-query the state again. We actually don't need to do that because we're always running. All right. Uh, one of the key goals uh, for Afona is also to integrate and collaborate with other system daemons. So today we're actually contributing or collaborating with two other projects, so Bluezy and Conman. Uh, Bluezy right now has a plugin for Afono for handling hands-free audio gateway capabilities. So you can actually use Afono to do some phone, you know, when you use your phone and you connect up a headset, uh, it sort of can basically create the phone roll. Um, we also use Bluezy for some audio streaming over uh, uh, SCO sockets. Anyway, uh, and the most important one is Conman, which basically manages the 3G connections that we have. So Afono doesn't actually manage any of the uh, 3G connections because we don't actually know what is the right thing to do with them. So that is Conman's job. So we actually expose um, all the 3G connections up to Conman, and Conman figures out whether it's the primary connection or the secondary or whatever. Um, and in the future, we'll probably um, integrate with NTPD for sort of network time settings and other daemons uh, as it makes sense. All right. Uh, today, we're actually working on a user space PPP implementation. So we found that using PPPD and doing it sort of the old-fashioned way uh, is really nasty, and it actually doesn't work well. So we're actually investing resources into creating a full-blown user space uh, PVP stack. Um, so once that is complete, we will actually support GPRS for all hardware that actually uses uh, PVP for data connections. We also need to support multiple active primary contexts and uh, also secondary contexts for GPRS. Power management, and eventually we want to support other technologies other than GSM. So things like CDMA, IMS, LTE, all of those are sort of in plans. But uh, right now, GSM is probably 80% of the market, so that's the one that we want to get right first. All right, let me quickly show you a quick demo. All right, so I have uh, Ofono running on my machine. Uh, basically, when you explore it using uh, DFeed debugger, can anyone see, can everyone see this? Sort of well, kind of well. I don't know if I can actually switch the font. But anyway, I'll talk you through this. Um, so we have sort of, as you can see, about four, five objects in the system. So two of them are actually modems. So HSO0 is a modem, and phone sim is a modem. Uh, phone sim is actually off right now, so it doesn't expose any of the any other objects uh, on it. Um, and there's a couple of uh, objects associated with HSO, but let's explore HSO. And so it actually has uh, several interfaces, and this is probably one of the bare minimum configurations that you have. So you basically have uh, the modem interface, which uh, sort of shows you some of the attributes like serial number and manufacturer. Uh, you have network registration, which uh, allows you to register and deregister, uh, look at your signal strength, your status. Uh, data connection manager, which allows you to do 3G data connections. So I'll show that in a little bit. Uh, SMS manager and SIM manager. So SMS manager, you can actually send SMSs with. Uh, so look at, let's look at network registration. So pretty much every um, pro every interface has several properties. 
and those properties can be obtained using the get properties method. So if we do that, we will see that we're currently registered and we have about 60% signal strength. Um, and then there's a bunch of other stuff uh, that we also expose. So like the current operator is Vodafone NZ. Um, you can actually get a bunch of other things in there uh, if your modem supports. Um, but two, so let's show the, the modem for instance. So again, you can use the get properties and basically uh, get some information about what this modem actually supports uh, and what the modem attributes are. So it, it gives you some basic information about the modem. Um, for data connections, one of the things that you can do is first to create a primary context. So if you actually need to you know, connect up your GPRS data card, uh, the first thing that you need to do is to put in the settings. So things like uh, your APN, your username, your password. Um, so the purpose of the primary context uh, interface is to actually do that. So if we examine that, I actually pre-populated this already. Uh, so basically we have, uh, yep. you know, access point name, we set the APN here. It's basically live.vodafone.com. Um, so once we have all of this set up, we can actually try to activate our 3G data connection. And so now it's active. So as you can see, I have a bunch of debugging stuff in there. But essentially what it did is it sent a bunch of proprietary commands down to the option card to actually enable the 3G, uh, 3G, uh, GPRS connection. And as you can see here, this is a D-Bus monitor running that basically looks at uh, what Ophono is doing. Uh, Ophono basically said, hey, there's a context up with a bunch of information about the network interface that was created specifically for this 3G data connection. And so essentially you get all of the information that you need in order to set up this connection. So the, the, the actual interface object, um, the address, the net mask, the gateway. So basically all you can need to do is either put it into your connection manager, so your connection manager can actually take all of this information and manage it however it needs. Or if you're doing something more simple, you can just create a script that actually listens for this and uh, puts it into your, um, into your system. So the, so the option modems actually support a in-kernel uh, module or in-kernel driver that actually handles all of the details behind the scenes. So the reason for this is that PPP is actually really slow, and you don't actually want to use it for high-speed connections. So in particular, if you have you know, 7.2 megabit or even bigger than that, you don't actually want to use PPP. So most manufacturers actually have proprietary vendor-specific ways of creating this interface. Exactly. Exactly. And Exactly. And the reason for this is, again, historical, is that it used to be that all of these devices were serial modems, so essentially just a serial link. And what do you use on a serial link? PPP. So they said, OK, we'll use that. And it turned out to be a really bad decision when you know, your bandwidth went from you know, GPRS speeds of 128K a second to you know, modern speeds of 7, 20, et cetera, megabits a second. So quite a big jump. So it's not configured, that's why it's not showing up by default. So what we did, we actually put in, uh, somebody else did this, but um, we have a connection manager called Conman in Moblin, so that's what we use. So we actually created a plugin for Conman that listens to Ophono, takes all of this information, gives it to Conman, and then Conman will actually manage this uh, for you. And so if you have Wi-Fi and you have 
3G and all of that sort of stuff, comment can actually intelligently choose which one to use at the, at the current moment. So, um, anyway, I think that's all I have for today. Um, there's a bunch of links uh, to the project. Uh, we also have a project called PhoneSim, but I didn't have time to actually talk about that. If anyone has any questions, now's the time. Uh, good question. Uh, overall, it's so okay. So let me start over. So there's actually several kinds of modems that you can have. So you can have uh, an AT command-based modem. AT command-based modems are actually quite easy. The reason for this is that uh, they actually the, the AT command set is actually defined by 3GPP. And for the most part, most manufacturers will actually, uh, I'm already on questions, um, will actually follow that standard. Uh, the difference is where they go, you know, a little bit outside the standard is for things which are not mandated, mandated by the spec. And also for things like, you know, extensions like, you know, all of these uh, proprietary ways to bring up a network interface, for instance. Uh, so this is where we basically have to actually do some work. Uh, we will f typically, it isn't that much work. It usually, uh, there's very key areas where we know there will be differences, and those are, I mean, to give you an idea, probably a thousand lines of code to actually implement something. So overall, we can integrate a new modem probably in about a week, if you know, if it's an AT based modem. If it's something like a completely proprietary binary protocol, like Nokia is using a completely binary protocol, I mean that pick your, you know, pick your time. Um, so they're actually having like a team of several guys actually working on their uh, integration for a phone. If I wanted, wanted to play with this now and uh, attach it to my netbook, mm -hmm. what device would you recommend I, I buy? Um, so I'm using, this is an option 401, so this is just a regular USB stick. So this is pretty much every option device that we, ha that we have tested just works out of the box. So if you have an option modem, that will work. Uh, today we also support uh, MDM modems, so like some of the Sony Ericsson devices that you can get, something like MD300 and a few devices that come with the Dell netbooks. Uh, those should also be supported. Uh, the vast majority of devices actually use PPP, and they're pretty slow, and so we're still working on that. Uh, we already have a prototype of the stack up and running, of PPP up and running, uh, but it's not been integrated yet, so we need to do some more work. But hopefully, end of this year, we'll actually support pretty much every device on the market. Would it be hard to integrate VoIP with um, the same feature? <laughs> so we're really not considering VoIP. Uh, the reason for this is that VoIP is completely different to GSM and CDMA and all of those technologies. So right now we're sort of ignoring VoIP. And I mean, maybe in the future where you know IMS is the next generation standard and it is largely VoIP based, so maybe that will become relevant, but today we just want to solve the GSM problem. And there are already solutions for VoIP. There's telepathy and a few others. So it's not like, you know, you can't do something about VoIP today. Um, I was just wondering, do you guys collaborate with the um, network manager guys? Like, is there some sort of overlap of of work in there? Uh, I mean, Conman is essentially another project that is sponsored by Moblin. So Moblin uses Conman as the network manager. So there is a lot of overlap between Conman and, uh, and network manager. Uh, Alfono is not really overlapping with network manager per se. We overlap with the modem manager project that is sort of the, the network manager equivalent. Uh, we're much more than what Modem Manager is doing. So Modem Manager only focuses on the 3G data aspects, whereas we are essentially a fully blown telephony stack. So we can do things that Modem Manager basically never considers, never even 
has dreams of. Um, so really, uh, I mean, to I think in the future, ideally, network managers should use Ofono for doing modern manager tasks. Uh, the only problem right now today is that Ofono doesn't support CDMA, and modern manager actually does. So this is one of the things that we need to figure out. So for us, CDMA is sort of probably the next big feature, maybe next year. So. Uh, last two questions, please. How much example codes and app, uh, apps are out there for the UI side of implementing and utilizing iPhone? Good question. Um, so as of right now, UI is really the area that we're severely suffering in. So there's not much code out there that uses Afono. So I, I'm hoping, you know, by presenting this and uh, you know giving you uh, an idea of what Afono can do somebody will actually start writing UI applications. Uh, inside Moblin, we do have several UI applications developed, and hopefully those will be released pretty soon so that you have at least an idea of where to start. Uh, but right now, there isn't really. However, the API is so simple that if you actually go into our repository, look at the Python scripts, Python example scripts, it'll be very easy to figure out what's going on. I mean, the API is very, very simple. You mentioned uh, telepathy. Yep. Uh, have you looked at or considered uh, integration with telepathy with regard to Ofono? Uh, good question. So uh, we didn't because we're again not trying to make an API that sort of encap encapsulates, you know, very. Um, we're very specific in what we want to actually accomplish. That is GSM and CDMA, whereas telepathy is applicable to just about any other technology. Uh, so there is integration work between Ofono and telepathy, but it's actually the other way. So there's somebody working on a telepathy connection manager that uses Ofono as the back end. So. All right, I think that's um, all the questions. If you'd like to thank Dennis for his excellent talk uh, in the usual manner. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.